thanks, Kevin, for joining us today. Uh, really appreciate it. Hope everything's well in Seattle. Yeah, uh, everything's great. Thanks so much for having me. No problem. Um, I'd like to start with some recent events that have been going on. Um, uh, recently, the, the S&P and the NASDAQ have had the worst start to the year since 2009. Uh, inflation's up to 7%, and uh, we're looking at a more hawkish Fed uh, potentially raising interest rates in March. Mm -hmm. um, how do we how do we let decision makers or business uh, or executives understand that uh, ESG is just as important in a volatile market as it is in a bull market? Yeah, absolutely. And I think that um, you know every time there's a, a you know kind of financial hiccup, everyone starts to question whether ESG pays off or not, and what what people should do. Um, so I can give a, a little background on that, and but I'll, I'll start with the more uh, contemporary issue about what you're talking about, what's happening right now in 2022. I think that, um, you know, what we're seeing with most companies is no matter what the market's doing, the investors, the analysts, the main shareholders are increasingly asking about ESG performance within a company. They're not shying away from it. In fact, they're, they're leaning into it more. So even with all the headwinds we're facing with global supply chain issues, the coronavirus, the market uncertainty, definitely interest rates coming up. Most companies I know, especially when I talk to our publicly traded clients, they're hearing from their investor relations people that, you know, people are serious about it. And it's not just the investors, it's large customers. So you get, you know, companies, I mean, everyone knows about like the Amazon Climate Pledge. But, you know, Microsoft, for example, has 100,000 plus suppliers, and they've been really pushing companies um, more so than ever on, you know, their ESG work, especially around climate. And, um, you know, went from, you know, hey, we want you to develop this, you know, kind of questionnaire over the last couple of years to no, you actually have to um, put things in place and you need to actually have a climate strategy within a six month period of time. And we want to see what you're doing to help us meet uh, Microsoft's, you know, 55 percent reduction goal by 2030. So companies that are that are saying, well, you know, there's other other priorities that are out there. Um, these are financial priorities on par with interest rate hikes, supply chain issues, what's going on in the market. Um, and then just giving a little historical context, I mean, we've heard about this all the way back since 1992 in the United States, you know, during the first George Bush administration, well, we can't sign the Rio Accord, this is going to hurt the economy, we can't sign the Kyoto Protocol. Then in 2002, the next Bush, well, we can't sign on at um, in, in Johannesburg because the economy is in flux coming off the dot bomb. You know, after, you know, 2000, you know, eight and the financial crisis, oh, we can't do, you know, things on climate change because of this, the coronavirus, you know, the Trump's up and down. The reality of it is those firms that have stronger ESG uh, performance, and this is not me talking, this is an AT Kearney study, have on average outperformed their peers by about $650 million in market cap. So, um, so any company that's saying, well, I don't know if we can do it. Actually, the companies that are doing it are outperforming. The, 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 what used to be called the Carbon Disclosure Project, now the CDP, has stats on their website. The companies with stronger ESG performance have an 11% higher uh, net positive return on investment. So right there, if all you're talking about is dollars and cents, the ESG you know, companies that are really leaning into are outperforming it. Now, going beyond the dollars and cents, when you start looking at funds like the Dow Jones Sustainable Index compared to the Dow, or the S&P 500's Social Environmental and uh, Social Innovation Index compared to the traditional S&P 500, going back a period over 15 years, all the way from, well, actually 17 years, all the way from 2004 through 2021, the, the Dow Jones Stanley Index and the S&P 500 sustainability indices both outperform their traditional counterparts. And this is during recession, during massive recovery, during you know, you know pandemics, everything. So the myth that companies need to you know put ESG on, on the back burner because of these, you know, what's happening in the market, um, it really doesn't uh, hold up. And the data shows otherwise. And mostly it's just a uh, it's a myth that's caught in people's head, you know, um, and so so organizations, I think, really need to not only own that and learn from that, but find ways that they can actually lean into the ESG stuff, because it, it's just like, um, you know, diversity, equity, inclusion two years ago. Companies thought they had a, a good policy in place. Um, then George Floyd and Brianna Taylor happened and everyone re-looks at their stuff and go, oh, we really need to put something in place. 
same thing's happening in climate uh, right now. You know, BlackRock and Larry Fink has put out, you know, saying all of our, our funds, thou shalt report to SASB and the TCFD, which means every company needs to actually do a climate scenario analysis. So we're seeing tons of companies coming to us um, asking for that specific type of help, which we offer, because really the, the analysts in the financial markets are demanding it, um, no matter what's happening kind of in the, the broader sphere. Yeah, you can definitely see the data. That's uh, very interesting to look at. But, you know, you, you talk about a little bit in your book, um, how to talk to the other side about bridging the gap between two mm -hmm. different groups and, and two different opposing views. Um, I, I'd like to take a look at how that, how one would approach that on a micro level within an organization, you know, for example, sure. a board where, where, you know, certain board members are pro ESG and others are, are more skeptical. How do we deal with that situation? Well, I think like, like any issue, um, ESG, whether it's climate diversity, whether it's, you know, uh, governance policies, you know, um, if they get, you know, people can t really quickly fall into their ideological, you know, sides on an issue. And so, the, and or a political side on it. And so the most important thing is to not let them. I, I figure that with most companies, um, and I would say most organizations where we've had boards that are split or executive teams are split or even the CEO split between the board and what they want to have happen with their own executive team. Um, when you show them the financials, the ideological mess kind of melts away. When you show them like, this is better for our organization overall, um, you know, financially better for our brand, um, that'll help us recruit and retain employees, which is incredibly important and difficult right now. Um, it'll reduce our risk, it'll reduce our, you know, exposure uh, to things in the marketplace, it'll help us get ahead of potential regulation from the SEC. When you talk about it in those terms, there's very little ideological stuff that gets intermixed. And when you show the data and show the trends and the stats, and you'll still see, you know, when you say those that are pro ESG, they already get it. Those that are anti SG, sometimes it's really about listening to what their true concern is. It's not so much that, you know, that they, that they don't want the company to do it, but maybe they know about a, a, a friend or a colleague who their company made a big commitment and um, it backfired against them. Or they, you know, they came out with a, a policy or procedure and um, they face backlash from their customers, employees, their vendors, or their investors. So whenever, I, I think, you know, so often in this business, people are wondering about how to convince the other side. How do you do that? More often than not, someone on the other side just needs to be listened to. They have a concern. Once you peel back that onion, you start finding that, um, that they're not really opposed at, at all. It's just that they've got this like one thing that's in the back of their head. You know, um, you know, it, it's kind of like, you know, if you're having a, a discussion with your parents and, you know, they just can't hear something because they, they, there's something that's caught in there and you need to like, okay, say what it is. So then you can start hearing my side of the, the, the issue. And I think that's the biggest thing that I, I found through the research that I was doing and, and certainly through my client work. Why I wrote the book, How to Talk to the Other Side, was that um, too often people who are pro ESG or in the environmental space or in the diversity, equity, inclusion space, they want to be telling people what they need to do. And what they first need to do is step back and listen to the other side because you already know what you need to do. You just need that person to be in a place where they're willing to accept and listen to what's being heard. But too often people come direct at something. Um, and, you know, I, I like to say it's. It's kind of like trying to reason with a toddler that's having a temp temper tantrum. You can't reason to them while they're having a temper tantrum. You need them to cool off, and then you then you talk to them about an hour. And it's really no different. It's just basic human stuff. And so when we talk to organizations on the board, not that they're having temper tantrums, I don't want to give that. Uh, but you know, and, and I had this uh, yesterday talking to a, a, a huge logistics provider, and um, there are members on the board who are totally on board, and there's members who are saying, "Well, you know, I don't really. We got other big, fit, we got other fish to fry. You know, hey, can we just get away with doing just a little bit of this, or can we? We're in compliance. Is that good enough?" And um, so you hear what their concern is, and when you start peeling it down, it might be, "Well, we just don't want to commit to something that we can't." attain and so then you have to say okay well, let's make not such a, a a giant commitment right off the bat you know let's let's not go for carbon neutrality today let's start on a, a commitment towards you know climate reduction 
and eventually know that a year or two we're going to make that commitment, but that way I can bring the board along. Or if they're saying, you know, I, I don't, you know, I'm worried about this, then you can also show them, like, what are all their peers doing? And does anybody figure this out? And when you say, no, not everyone's figured this out, but look at the 240 companies that signed on to the climate pledge. Look at the RE100. Look at the 15 other different, uh, you know, organizations and pledges that are out there and who's doing it. When they start seeing that their customers, their vendors, their suppliers, their, um, you know, their peers are all doing this, it kind of then, you know, it, it lowers their blood pressure. And so I think that the most important thing is listening to why someone has that resistance and not what they say on the superficial level, but asking, you know, a few, you know, levels below that so you can really get to the core of what their concerns are. So I think that should be really helpful for some of our listeners to, to you know, uh, take that approach when addressing these issues. You also touched upon previous a little bit about how, um, what we've kind of seen is some cycles in ESG where, where at certain points the G is more in focus and at certain points the E is in more focus and mm -hmm. uh, and recently the, the social aspect has been in focus. Um, but we, we know that all three need to be uh, together in sync to, to really create value. Um, how can organizations take that approach and ensure that their ESG is, is taking a holistic approach and not just focusing mm -hmm. on one area and neglecting the other two or, or whatever kind yeah. of company they're using? That's a that's a great question because there there used to be kind of a little uh, you know back and forth between you know hey there'd be a giant oil spill like you know the Deep Horizon or there'd be supply chain eruptions you know because of Fukushima and then there'd be fires in a um, in a warehouse in Bangladesh and people would be all of a sudden so the S and the and the E have always kind of uh, gone back and forth that's not happening now. Um, it is a totally different world now than it was uh, two years ago. Climate is front and center in every investor call. Diversity, equity, inclusion is like, you know, front and center, not only on that side, but also your employees are going to your perspective employees. And if you don't have a strong diversity and equity and inclusion, you might just be saying, hey, we're stuck in the 1970s, you know, in terms of our culture. Um, we do have companies that, will approach us from time to time and they'll say, well, we want you to just focus on the E. We just want you to focus on the G or, you know, a little bit on the S and G, but we got our E figured out. And the reality is they don't. Um, and so, you know, we would use it kind of as a tone the door strategy to help them kind of educate and see how things are connected. So we just had a, a, a manufacturing company, you know, tell us like, okay, we want to get the, the, you know, we're trying to hire a, a you know, a sustainability director, or a climate director, but we only want them to focus on on the E side. And I said, okay, prepare to get less than great candidates. And they said, why? And I said, because anybody who gets this needs to be in the E, S, and G space. They need to be moving it on the governance side. They need to be aligning with your current diversity, equity, inclusion efforts and your social efforts. Um, and they need to be in there. And they're like, really? Well, we just, we've got someone in, in HR that's really working and we've got a team. We just want to hire some to the, for the E side. And I said, okay, just prepare to find, you're not going to find a great person. You're not going to find a great candidate because everyone who is an expert or even close to an expert sees the linkages between the ES and G and how the G is super responsible for holding people accountable on the E and the S side. And without the G, you don't have that, um, you, you don't have the carrot or the stick. Um, you just have a lot of great intentions. So um, increasingly, it is becoming uh, something where it, it needs to be fully integrated. And I think that's one of the things that, um, you know, we, we really try and strive with organizations. We'll meet them where they are and we don't, you know, force anything down their throats. But we obviously, you know, work with them in a way that helps them understand how these are connected. And a lot of the things that they have already probably done over the last two years on diversity, equity, inclusion in terms of hiring and purchasing policies and spend, they can easily do the exact same thing on the E side. They just need to link them together. Um, and why would you create two separate policies and have everyone you know, struggling over the same things? Why wouldn't you integrate them to save time, energy, money, make it easier for not only your employees, but your suppliers? When you make that, that just kind of common sense comment, they go, oh, yeah, I get it. Um, but too often it gets caught in that ideological, like, you need to, we need to do this. And this is why as opposed to much more, the, you know, bring it down to the practical level and how it can play out on a day-to-day -day within an organization. Great. So, so that's really interesting to look at the, the transition just from the past few years 
to uh, in the ESG space. Um, we like to discuss what ESG might look like in the next few years. Uh, so what are your opinions on that? Gosh, I, I honestly feel like we're in a space where we're going to, within the next four to five years, you're not going to be talking about ESG. It's just the way business is done. So I, I liken it to, um, you know, and maybe some of the younger audience doesn't, doesn't remember this, but anybody who's Gen X or even, you know, high-end millennial remembers that, um, you know, in the 90s, you heard about, oh, what is your e-business strategy? You know, it's like you had you had your business strategy and you had a separate e-business strategy. Well, now everything's just done, you know, e-business and it has been for 20 years. We're pretty close to that tipping point now. Um, I think that, you know, one of the reasons why our company called Sustainable Business Consulting was our, our view is like, we want a world where sustainable business isn't a way of doing business. It's the way. And that the term will just disappear, kind of like ESG is taking over today. So I think that um, certainly it's not going to happen in the next year or two, but it's pretty darn close to probably within three to five years that um, companies, the ESG will just be you know, part of how a company does business. The reporting will be just similar to how they do their financial reporting. Um, it's already happening in Europe. It, you know, There's ESG reporting requirements of one form or another in 34 different countries, not including the United States. But if you're publicly traded, um, you know, thou shalt do SASB and TCFD or you will, you know, you know, feel the wrath within the next year or two. So I think um, it's, it's not going to take too long um, for it to be fully integrated in terms of that. I think where you're going to start seeing is much more the conversation about the integration between the S and the E. Um, you know, you've got, it seems like you've got environmentalists and then you've got social justice advocates. Well, the reality is you can't have, um, you know, you're not going to have sustainability without social justice and you're not going to, you can make uh, impacts on climate change, but the impacts of climate change disproportionately impact those at the lower end of the socioeconomic perspective. And so if you really want to have a true, authentic climate policy, you got to be addressing the social justice issues at the same time. And so it might just be called climate justice. I don't know what the term is going to end up being. But I think that you're going to see that happen. I think you're going to see um, certainly you know, there's a lot of a lot of companies right now that are making various pledges um, on, on climate and towards carbon neutrality. And pretty much everyone knows that if we just get to carbon neutrality by 2030, we're probably still cooked. So we need to make massive reductions like within the next seven and a half years. So I think you're going to see much more of the leading organizations moving towards climate positivity and trying to do you know, more good rather than less bad. Um, and I think you're also going to see a mindset shift on ESG as opposed to thinking of it as just like, here's this thing we have to do for more of a compliance to moving it more over. Here's a way that it's going to drive innovation, creativity, top line revenue growth, as opposed to right now, it's been seen more of as a, hey, there's some cost savings here. And I think that you know, you're seeing organizations like Iron Mountain, which is, should be known for you know, a company that picked up all of your documents and stored it securely and now, you know, secures your electronic documents. Well, their business is absolutely booming because they have the, you know, the document storage and the, the cloud-based services, but they use renewable power. And companies that are trying to find ways to reduce their, you know, impact, um, one of the easiest ways of doing that is moving your data centers to uh, renewable power. And so Iron Mountain has experienced serious top-line revenue growth by using and thinking through how ESG could help them drive that. And that's just a, a, an example in a very boring industry. Like I'm sure many of the listeners aren't like, hey, yeah, I want to get into paper document storage for my lifetime. You know, and this is what this company has done as they've evolved as the company, but also used ESG to help drive their business performance. That's a very optimistic outlook, and I like it. So that's great. Well, Kevin, thank you so much for coming on the podcast and sharing some of your insights. I really appreciate it. I'm sure our listeners will too. Well, thanks so much. And for all the listeners, if you want to check us out, uh, our website is www.sustainablebizconsulting.com or you can follow us on Twitter. Um, but uh, thanks so much for having us today and really appreciate uh, the time and the call today.